We have been uh, at, in a church in a sermon series on, uh, do you feel hopeless? Do you feel hopeless? So, so we live in a world in which a lot of people actually do feel hopeless. And in other words, like the last sermon series, we looked at what is your greatest challenge? And the difference between a challenge and hopelessness is that when someone has a challenge, they actually, they, they at least think, hey, you know what? I can overcome this. But when one gets to the place where they actually feel hopeless, that this is where they're just like, why try? Why should I try? Why should I invest any time in, in trying to make this better? Why should, I, why, why should I care about that or that person or that situation? Why should I, even, why should I do anything? I might as well just sit there and veg out in front of the television set and do nothing. And this is the reason why in our world we have a lot of individuals who run to escapism. They run here and they run there trying to find something to give them hope. And they run to anything and everything. Some run to drugs, some run to sex, some run to wealth. It it doesn't really matter. People run to things trying to find some semblance of hope. And yet, in this world, all of those things are going to, at the end of the day, find themselves fleeting. They will not satisfy. They will not satisfy. And so, the question then is, is should we then, as believers, should we actually ever go through life feeling hopeless as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? In other words, as individuals who have actually cried out and said, Lord Jesus, I recognize I'm a sinner. No, and sinner is nothing but another term that just means I've missed the mark. That's all that it means. In other words, I, you had a perfect standard. Your standard was perfection, and I wasn't perfect. I, I told the lie. I, I broke the speed limit, which I know some of you are sitting going, that's not a sin. Yeah, yeah, it, actually it is. I broke the speed limit, you know, whatever it is, you know, I, I, I stole at work by taking the paper clip or a pen. Yes, I know you're sitting there going, that's not thievery. That's not a sin. Yeah, actually, actually it is. It wasn't yours to take and you took it, right? My point is we've all been there. That's the, every one of us. All, this is what the Bible says, all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us. So as a result, what we then do, we recognize that, and we who are in Christ, we've cried out and we said, Lord Jesus, save me. Because there's nothing you can do to to make the gap filled. You can't fix the, the sin problem. You can't do good enough. You can't be good enough. Your good works, according to the Old Testament, are nothing more than filthy rags before God. So your absolute very, 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 very best is as filthy trash rags to the Lord God because your life has been so tainted with other sin. And so God, knowing that there was nothing we could do to get to Him, said, I will make a way, and Jesus came to the earth and died on that cross for us. Because see, in the book of Hebrews, we're told that, that all things are cleansed by blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no covering, no remission, no removal of sin. God created the perfect standard. And so He required a perfect sacrifice in order to, a, it's called appeasing it, to make atonement for us, to make, it's in other words, to make something right. It requires a perfect sacrifice. And Jesus was perfect because He is God, and He is man. So He identified with us in His 100% manship, and He also was perfect in His 100% that He's God, and that's why He went to the cross of Calvary. And so anyone who cries out and says, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner, Christ Jesus says, I will come in, and I will dine with Him, and He with me. In other words, I will come and I will live within Him. And then in the book of Ephesians, in the first chapter and in the fourth chapter, he tells us that we are sealed, sealed, like vacuum packed, sealed in the Holy Spirit. And nothing can get to us. And we're sealed until the day of our redemption. So here's why I'm bringing this up, is that for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we probably ought never to feel hopeless. And so we have been looking through in this series that we're in, in the book of Revelation, at different reasons why we as believers should not ever feel hopeless. 
And today we're going to be looking at how we have the hope of true faith. We have the hope of true faith. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me or by me. This is what Jesus says. And so because Jesus says, I, there's no other way. In fact, in the book of Acts, it says, there's no other name by which one can be saved other than the name of Jesus. Because of this reality, and this isn't about just head knowledge. This isn't like, like oh, you know some statistical or uh, historical facts about like George Washington or the American Revolution or the Civil War. It's not about knowing facts. This is about a relational knowing of Jesus. If you have that, he says you have true faith. And so we're going to look at the, the, that's the hope we have, but we're going to look at what the world offers in today's passage. So if you would, if you don't have a Bible, you can reach forward into that pew back in front of you, grab the book of uh, the Bible there. And if you do not have a Bible, we would love for you to take that with you as a gift from us, because we want everybody reading the word of God. And like I said, we're in the book of Revelation. So if you go to the very, very last book, the very last book to the very far right of the, of the Bible, there's a book there called Revelation. The chapters are the big numbers. The verses are the little numbers. And we as a church have finally gotten ourselves to chapter 17. Chapter 17. And we're going to read through this entire chapter, but I'm going to do it as we come to each of the, of the points. So again, you've already heard about the YouVersion app. If you want to follow along that way, or if you want to use the actual bulletin insert there, you can fill out the, your notes on that if you want to take notes. And we're going to be looking at why we have hope of true religion as we look at false religion, as we look at false religion. Okay. So having said all that, let's go to the Father just very briefly and ask him to help us understand this particular book of Revelation or this chapter of Revelation. Father, I do thank you for this time. I thank you for the opportunity we have to come together and to find that we actually do have hope in you, that we can turn to you no matter what our circumstances, no matter how far we've run from you, you are always right there. Just like the prodigal son, the father was sitting there looking. And when he saw his son from a far way off, he ran to his son and he hugged, embraced his son. He put the, the robe of the family around him. He gave him the, the ring. He put sandals on his feet and he's kissed his son over and over again. Father, this is what you do for us. You always want to restore us and give us true faith and to bring us into a right relationship with you. Help us to hear the truth and see what the, the world system is doing to draw us away from you as we even look at this, this um, 17th chapter. Father, give us your clarity by your Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What, what you need to understand is that chapter 17 and chapter 18, and that's where we are, we're in 17. Next week, we're going to look at chapter 18. Chapter 17 and chapter 18 are a fuller explanation of Revelation chapter 16, verse 19. So Revelation 16, 19, if you'll just go back a few verses from where we are, you'll see it says this. It says, the great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. In other words, where we have been in this journey in the book of Revelation is we've looked at uh, all the stuff with the seals and all that goes on. We've seen the rapture of the church. We've seen the seven trumpets. We've seen the seven bowls. And the final bowl is the final end. So in other words, all those who have not been in Christ or those who did not, uh, who had received the mark of, of God and, and uh, Jesus there after the rapture of the church and didn't receive the mark of the beast, all of those who lived through that, endured through it, those are all spared. And then in that 30-day window, and again, I know I'm talking, if you're new to the Bible, if you're new to the Bible, don't worry about all these things. We've got, you can go back to our church's website. It's on your bulletin there, and you can watch all the sermons in this book of Revelation series from January to now, and you can get yourself caught up. Don't, don't get overwhelmed by some of the language, because uh, you're stepping in here where we've been in this journey. So you're, you're just a little behind, but you can always catch yourself back up. But th we're in this 30-day window where God is, has been pouring out His wrath on the, on the nations and on, on those who do not have a relationship with them, for those who receive the mark. And when we got to the seventh bowl, 
God said, it is done. And that is where all who are not in God actually are going to perish. And what happens is then Babylon the Great, all of God's wrath, this wine of God's wrath is poured out on her and she is utterly destroyed. This, chapter 17 and 18, is a fuller representation of that. Chapter 17 is all about religion. Chapter 18 is all about government. Because the Antichrist uses both of those to lead people away from God. So you're looking, if you're taking notes, your very first point is this. It's the second woman of Revelation. The second woman of Revelation. So read with me verse 1 and 2. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. Now, this is talking, again, we're talking about, this is all about religion. This entire chapter is about religion. And what people do, how they serve religion, whether they realize they're serving religion or not, and how it leads one astray. And so we say, this point is, this is the second woman. This angel that is referenced here, this angel is probably the angel who actually dispensed the seventh bowl, the final judgment bowl. That is more than likely who this particular angel is. The first woman was actually found in Revelation 12, and we saw that that, angel, that woman was Israel, the entire nation of Israel in Revelation 12. Well, now, so we saw, we saw the one side. Now we see the second woman, and this second woman is Babylon. This, this false religion is now the second woman. And then in a few chapters, we're actually going to see a third woman, and it's actually the church. It's actually the church. So there's going to be three women brought up through this entire book. Uh, and this is, this is what we see here. Also, it says that this woman here, it says that she, uh, she who sits on many waters. But when we get to verse 15, we're actually going to find the definition of what those many waters are. And basically it's this. It is the, all of the lost people of the world. So this false religion is sitting on all of the people who are lost. And lost just means they do not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means. If one does not have a relationship with Jesus, they are lost. They are not His. You you cannot go to heaven based on your parents' faith. You cannot go to heaven based on your grandparents' faith. You can't go to heaven based on whatever church you go to and say, well, I'm a member of that church. Church membership does not get you to heaven. A personal relationship alone is what gets one to heaven and with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is here saying religion has confused a lot of people. And because they know things about God, they think that that makes them okay. The problem is, is when we get to like Matthew chapter 25, Jesus starts talking about, he says, there's going to be this this sorting. And there's going to be individuals who say, um, Jesus is going to say, hey, the, when, when I was hungry, you didn't, you didn't feed me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was in prison, you didn't come visit me, right? And then these individuals are going to go, Lord, when, when did we see you like that and not do this? And he says, when you didn't do it to the least of these, you didn't do it unto me. And the whole point that Jesus is making in, in talking about that is he says, there's a lot of people who actually do works of, of service, but have no relationship with him. If all you have is intellectual facts about Jesus, it's not enough. You have to have a relationship with him. And that is this distinction. And many, many waters, there's a lot of lost people who religion wraps up and binds. In fact, Jesus says this way, he says, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many there are that find it. And narrow is the road that leads to life, and few there are that find it. In other words, there's going to be a lot more lost people than saved people. And the whole reason is because of false religion and the way that the world drives us. By the way, you can actually have a religion of yourself. You can actually have a religion of your kids. You can have a religion of pleasure. You can have your work can be your religion. That's it can, it's not just buildings and organizations. Anything that you give your heart to becomes a religion in and of itself. And, and this harlot, this woman, is deceiving the world with all of the false pullings. Which, which leads us then to, to the second point, which is the woman's character. 
What is this woman's character like? What is this false religion? What is she like? Well, look with me at verses 3 through 5. It says, And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of ab um, abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, A mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So the beast who, who gets on her is, we're going to see him in the next chapter, in the 18th chapter. He, the beast is the government. That's what he is. He's, it's a government. That's what the beast is. All right? The woman uses government for her own ends and purposes. And all we have to do is look through human history, all of human history, and we can see where, where, the, where the, the governments have tried to manipulate religious systems and to utilize them to make people subjugate to the governmental authorities. We've seen it all through human history. Okay? Um, and, and in this, I mean, think about it. What, what, with, with, if we go back to ancient days, like with, with Egypt back in that time, what did Pharaoh, what did he say he was? He was a god. Same thing when you go to Babylon and when you go to Rome even. You know, whenever you go to these places, they actually start to say, hey, I am God. Even when you move into the modern day time, even individuals like Hitler actually had a God complex and thought he was a form of a deity. This is the craziness of human history. And they try to manipulate religion to control the masses. Note, notice here in this that she also has a name on her forehead. Just like the 144,000 have a name on their forehead. Those who worship the beast have a mark on their forehead or on their forearm. Uh, we in, in, in uh, the church, it tells us, like we already referenced Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 6, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. We're, well, that seal, if you will, it's, you can't see it, but you're sealed on, on your forehead. In other words, who you are, what is written or, or you are sealed by, it defines and tells who you belong to. When you are sealed, it's saying, who, are you, who do you belong to? If we're in Christ, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, and we belong to God. If, if we're of the false religions and we're, we're sealed by, by her, it's on our foreheads. And this woman is no different. She is sealed on her forehead saying she belongs to Satan. Okay? And then, and then it talks about how part of, again, part of her character is all of this uh, um, abomination, all of this iniquity, all of this blasphemy. This is her character. In other words, she is literally the antithesis of everything that God is. She wants to do everything she can to steer people away from God. That's what she wants to do. And how, and how does she do that? Again, with this mystery. Mystery, mystery in the New Testament is, is literally nothing more than something that was not revealed in the Old Testament. That's all that the mystery is. So for example, for example, in Ephesians chapter 5, we're, to, we're told about the mystery of the church. That, that In other words, that, that from two, God will make one new man. That's basically what the mystery of the church is. Okay, uh, In Romans chapter 11, verse 25, it talks about the mystery of Israel's blindness in part until the fullness of the Gentiles come, which is what happens at the rapture that we talked about, and then the 144,000 that get their ceiling. Uh, Babylon here is a mystery. And, it, and what is this mystery all about? It is all about iniquity. Coming back to this woman's character. This is what he's saying. Look, at this, at this point, the world is going to be able to recognize that the false religions are nothing more than that of iniquity and abomination. Because that is their very character. It is who they are. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, we're told of the mystery of the rapture. And that we shall not all sleep, but we all will be changed. Again, mystery is literally nothing more than something that was not revealed in the Old Testament is now being brought to light in the New Testament. That is literally all that it is. In other words, it's not a whodunit mystery murder. It's not that. It's just a bringing to light that which was formerly not known. So we now understand that this is this mystery being revealed of the iniquity of false religion. 
So let me just very briefly dive a little deeper into this mystery of Babylon, this mystery about this iniquity. It actually all starts back, even with, with the fall, but specifically with, with an early descendant of, of uh, the line of Cain with a gentleman named Nimrod. Nimrod. Some of you all, you're sitting there going, Scott, I don't know where you're talking about. It's okay. Just, just stay with me. If you're new to the Scriptures, it's all right. The more time you spend in the Word of God, the more you learn things, and the more you're able to apply things to your life. And there is this guy named Nimrod back there in the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. And, um, and he is really where this whole system of, of, of false religion and false government, it stems from him. His name, Nimrod's name, literally means revolt. That's what it means. It means revolt. And what you, you may not know the name Nimrod, but you know what he did. He's the guy that built the Tower of Babel. That's who this guy is. And the reason he wanted to build this Tower of Babel was because, remember, he wanted to get to the sky. He wanted to get to the heavens. He wanted to basically get to God and say, I am God. And everything about that tower was actually devoted to the sun god. It's amazing. Ra, the Egyptian, that they thought that was the sun god and that he had connections with the Pharaoh and stuff. There's all these things to this sun god. So Nimrod was literally the first to try to build this one world order. Remember, everyone had the same language, and he tried to bring everybody there. And it's after this that God disperses the language and scatters the people. But why is that? Because he's trying to create those one world order that the Antichrist is going to succeed in building. That's what he's going to So all of this fits in together. Now, this is where it gets really weird, and I'm going to kind of run this with you. This is, this is for you nerds, okay? This is for you, for you Bible nerds, this is for you. If you're not one of those, this is your permission to take a nap. I'll, I'll, make, it, I'll make a note and tell you when to come back in. It's good. It's fine. You just, take it, just put your head down, and this is your chance, okay? So if you're, a, if you're a Bible nerd, this one's for you. If you're not, just zone out. You know, this is grab your phone, look at your Facebook account real quickly, your Instagram account. That's what this moment is for, okay? I'll, I'll bring you back in just a second, all right? So, so let's run down this little nerdy line with you just for a second. Nimrod's wife was a woman named uh, Semiramis. Again, a name all of us are familiar. I, I think about Semiramis all the time. I didn't think about Semiramis until I wrote this sermon, okay? Semiramis, uh, and what her title was is she was known as the Queen of Heaven. Remember, Nimrod was trying to get to the heavens, and he does this whole thing with worshiping the sun god, okay? So Nimrod marries Semiramis, this queen of heaven, and she claimed that Nimrod himself was a god, and that her newborn son, which arrived after Nimrod died, was Nimrod reincarnated. I know, that got weird. So in other words, Nimrod gets Semiramis pregnant, he dies, and when she gives birth, she says that her son is actually the reincarnation of Nimrod. Now she doesn't call him Nimrod, she gave him a different name, but yet that's, his name was Tammuz. Tammuz was his name. But Tammuz is the reincarnated spirit of Nimrod. Now, here's how this happened. Here's how they, this went with this, okay? This is their, their, their crazy thought process. When Nimrod died, because he was deity, he went to the sun. And then on a sun beam, yes, it's true, on a sun beam, he came back, and that's how he then put himself inside of Semiramis for her to give birth, Okay? So now you have this godlike character coming to earth and becoming born of a woman. Does that sound familiar to any other thing? Do you understand why Jesus and why Satan would do this? Why the Antichrist, why Satan would do this in religion? Because it creates confusion. Because remember, Satan has no creativity. He can do nothing on his own thoughts. And yet, before the foundations of the earth, God has always been. So in other words, there's always been God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Satan knew because he was created and he was, the, he was in heaven with the Lord God. He knew there was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
And he knew when God said that the, that your seed there in the, after the fall, he said the seed of the serpent would strike the heel of the seed of the woman, but that woman's seed would crush his head. He knew that this was all referencing the Lord God's son. So he says, hey, I'll tell you what, I can make confusion among this, and I'm going to confuse people with this false religion. And from here, it starts here, and then it perpetuates out into everything. Okay? So there's been this whole thing about this thing. By the way, here's another one of those areas where, where, she, there, where it gets corrupted. Um, T- uh, Tammuz, Tammuz went after he was born. Remember, he's the reincarnation of Nimrod. He's out hunting one day and gets killed by a wild boar. Okay? And again, this is, none of this is true. I mean, this is, this is, what, this is where the faith, this is what they, the faith that they hold to, it starts here. And this is their story, their mythology of where it all begins. Okay, so he was killed by this wild boar, and Semiramis wept for 40 days. Sound familiar? 40 d- tears, water, 40 days. wonder where she got that one from. Uh, maybe because God actually did flood the earth? Uh-huh. So she cries for 40 days, and after the 40 days of crying, Tammuz comes back to life. Anyone else come back to life? Jesus, the real one who comes back. Again, false religion here, okay? So ever since then, there's been this thing with mother-child religion systems in play. So let me do this very rapidly. In Egypt, Semiramis was known as Isis, and Nimrod was known as Osiris. And it is after his death that Isis, through Osiris, in his death state, is able to have her son Horus. In Assyria, Semiramis is known as Ishtar, and the son from the same kind of story was known as Bacchus. In Indies, India, Semiramis was known as Isa, and the son was known as Iswara. And in Asia, Semiramis was known as Sibyl, and the son was known as Ous. In Greece, Semiramis was known as Aphrodite, and the son was known as Eros. In Rome, Semiramis was known as Venus, and the son was known as Cupid. And why would all these religions have the same dad godlike figure coming back as a reincarnate son? Is because Satan does everything he can to twist religious systems because of what Jesus Christ really is. Because Jesus Christ really is God's son. And he really did die, and he really did come back to life. In fact, in Jeremiah 44, 15 uh, 15 through 19, Jeremiah actually condemns Israel for worshiping Semiramis. You can go look it up yourself. In Ezekiel, he condemns them for the same thing, for worshiping Tammuz in the book of Ezekiel. So you can go and look those things up on your own. So, all right, we got a couple more points, and we got to run more rapidly, but these are much shorter in length. So the, the woman's character is that of perversion, iniquity, blasphemy, immorality. So now, if you got done with the nerdy stuff, this is your chance. Come back, and let's keep going along, because uh, the nerdy stuff is now over. So here's your third point, the woman's deeds. So her character was that of blasphemy and and abomination. So what is her actual deed? Look at me at verse 6. What does she do? And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. So what were her deeds? False religion did nothing more than persecute Christians and put them to death. And that is what false religion does. For those that are old enough, you'll remember this kind of stuff happens like with Jim Jones, right? Down in the 60s, when he grabs those people and he takes them down, they all drink that Kool-Aid, which is where that expression comes from, right? False religion. How many times have we seen false religions have their followers put themselves to death? Even in the Bible, Elijah, Baal, have that cosmic, con- or have that, that, uh, that, that, uh, conversation, this, this time of testing, and the bell prophets start cutting themselves. When it says they're cutting themselves, what they're, trying, they're doing is they're spilling their blood, trying to get their God to respond. Because that's what false religion offers, is only death. And that's what's happening here. So what is her deeds? To persecute and to kill. That is what she does. So, so who are the woman's allies? So her character is that of, of blasphemy and immorality. Her deeds are that of death and what, who are her allies? Her allies are found in verses 7 through 13. In 7 through 13, we read these words. And the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her. 
which has the seven heads and the ten horns. We've already mentioned that, but I didn't discuss it then because I knew this part was coming. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. Remember, the beast is government. And those who dwell on the earth whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundations of the world will wonder when you see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And they are seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. The beast, which was and is not, is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven. And he goes to destruction. Then the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom. But they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose. And they give their power and authority to the beast. There was a lot there, but let's try to make it as simple as we can just for a moment. When it said there it was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss, this is talking about how government, the beast, has actually traversed through human history. Government has always existed. It always has. And there's different forms of it along the way that we've seen. And government rules and reigns the tides of human history. What is being said here is there's basically there's this one government that's going to go to destruction. But this government will be led by the Antichrist, which we saw back in Revelation 13. And he's going to basically bring this. He's this composite. Remember, the Antichrist reign is he's the composite of all these other governments. And he brings them together and unifies them. And he mentions here that there's these seven kingdoms. Remember, he talked about he says there's these uh, the seven kings, uh, excuse me, so there, there are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, one has not yet come, and one he comes, he must reign for a little while. That is talking about these government periods of time in human history. And we've already looked at them, so I'm not going to go in depth about them uh, at length, but I'm going to at least name them for you. Those five that were are Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. Because remember, this is written in the first century. Then John says, and one is. Well, who, what was the government at the time that John wrote this? Rome. So you had Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece. Those are the five before. One is, that's Rome. And he says, and one is going to come, but he's only going to last for a little while. I've already shared with you. I think, and I can't prove it, so I can't be dogmatic about this. I think that was Germany. I think what Hitler did was that final thing. Because what is the purpose of every one of these kingdoms? Every one of these kingdoms, what did they try to do? They tried to eliminate God's people. Herod the Great worked for Rome. And what does he do when Jesus is born? He kills all the children. Because he's trying to kill the seed of Adam and Eve from all the way back then. That seed that was going to crush Satan's head. So Rome is even used there with, with, with Herod the Great trying to kill Jesus. And then who actually does put Jesus to death? Rome puts Jesus on the cross. Rome puts Jesus on the cross. And Satan thinks he's won. But what does Jesus do? He rises again. So this is what, And so what did Germany try to do during the Holocaust? They killed over 7 million Jews. 11 million people total, but 7 million Jews. Why? Because he wants to eliminate the line of, of the Jewish people. And then it says, and yet there's one more that's going to come. That is that compilation. That is the Antichrist. He's the eighth kingdom that is to come. In the 70s, in the 70s, people thought the European Union was it. That was until they got to 10, uh, or excuse me, when they got past 10. Until when they got to past 10 countries, then they went, oh, maybe it's not the European Union. Okay? I don't think that this 10 has happened yet. Because you'll notice it said that it's only, they're going to only last for like one hour. I think that they're the ones that come on the scene at the, 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 during that 70th week of Daniel, that end of the age time period. And I think it's a basically, this is me, I think it's a division of the world. And I don't think we have a clue what that division is. In other words, I don't think it's Europe, and I don't think it's the Middle East. I think this is how the Antichrist is going to divide the world up basically into ten regions. 
And those 10 regions are going to serve the Antichrist. Because remember, it's one world government. And he is over the entire world. And these 10 have been around for one hour. And what do they do? They give their power and their authority to the Antichrist. I think it's his tool of how he is going to rule the world for that very brief time. That's who those 10 are. Okay? And so we don't know who they are. You can't say, oh, it's Europe. It's this. We don't know. Okay? And even if we did, even if I'm wrong, you still can't say it's Europe because we still don't know. <laughs> okay? You just don't know. We don't know. So this leads us to our very last point. And here's where we're going to wrap up. What, what is going on? We see the woman's war. So we've seen her character. We've seen her deeds. We see her allies, is government. And now we actually see the woman's war. Look with me at verses 14 through 18. It says, these will wage war against the lamb. And the lamb will overcome them. Because he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And those who are with him are the called and the chosen and faithful. Remember, uh, this whole sermon is about the true Faith, true faith. This is the distinction. We have hope because we have true faith. And what does this passage say about us? We, because we are with the Lamb, we have overcome. This is why we do not have to lose hope. Verses 15 and on. And he said to me, The waters which you saw where the, where the, where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. In other words, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many there are that find it. And the ten horns which you saw, and the beast, these will hate the harlot, and make her desolate and naked, and will eat her flesh, and will burn her up with fire. What is happening here is basically the Antichrist, he puts away with all other false religions when he comes on the scene, because he is the only one to be worshipped. Remember, he makes the image of the beast, and he puts it in the temple, and all the world has to bow down and worship it. So he eliminates all other false religions and he sets himself up in the seat of government and the religion of the world. Okay? And that's why he eats her from all these other things. Okay? For, for verse 17, for God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So this is all about this, fall, this, 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 this false religion and, again, this battle that she is going to have with the Antichrist. I mean, with, with God, the battle she's going to have with God. And this really is, this is almost a fulfillment of like Psalm 2. In Psalm 2, we're not going to read Psalm 2, but the thought is that throughout all the ages, religion and government went hand in hand and used each other. And to, to, to devour people. And then this one government ruler is going to wipe it all out. So religious Babylon is now destroyed here in the 17th chapter. And next week we're going to look at how the governmental side of Babylon is going to be destroyed next time. Okay, And we're going to look at the hope that we have in real governance. In real governments. So how do we apply all this? You're sitting there going, man, Scott, there's a lot of nerdy stuff in there today. How do we apply this? Here's how we apply it. God has a, divine, has a divine plan unfolding in human history. You can take hope and courage that God has a divine plan unfolding in human history. In other words, he already knows the end from the beginning. And he's already telling us, we as believers, open up your eyes, see what is happening in the world, and see how it applies to these end time events, so that you can be prepared. So when the hard days come, you can sit there and say, you know what? God already told us about this. God already told me. And because God already told me, it can actually increase my faith to say, here I am. With Christ and Christ alone, I stand firm. I'm not going to be persuaded by false religions. I'm not going to be persuaded by false government. My faith is in Christ and Christ alone. And it gives us that hope. But that is only for those who are actually in Christ. Maybe you're, you're never received Christ. Maybe you're watching online. You've never asked Christ to come into your life. Then, then we have this time that we call an invitation where we give opportunity for people to respond to Jesus. And we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song. And when we do, you can just come out in the aisle, come down here and say, I need to give my life to Jesus. I know about Jesus. I know about religion, but I don't know Jesus relationally as a person. And I need to know him. Well, if that's you, come down. I'd love to tell you. But it's really, it's as simple as saying, Jesus saved me a sinner. Enter into my life. 
make me whole and clean and one with you. That's really all you're doing. And if you do that online or you do that here in person, just let us, let us know if you do it online that we can follow up and just help encourage you in your walk with Jesus. It's how do you do this? How do we walk with him? That's what, that's what real faith is all about. And we have our hope because we have real faith. We have real faith. Maybe you need to say, look, I've already done that, but I'm not ever followed through with the believer's baptism. Or I need to join this fellowship. Well, you can come down as well and come down the aisle and just let us know what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do this morning. But whatever the Spirit says, you walk in obedience to Him as we come to this time of decision. So let's go to the Father for a moment in prayer. Father, I, I thank you again. I thank you so much for the work of your Son, Jesus, and for what He's done and what He did. And that, that even though we can see the evidence of false religion all over the world, and we can see the arrogance and the blasphemy of false religion, as it has led literally billions of people throughout human history down a path to destruction. We in Christ can take courage and hope knowing that you really are the one true God. And the evidence truly is overwhelming and abundantly clear if we would but investigate the truth of your scriptures. Father, let us find our hope in you and you alone. May today be the day of salvation for many. And may we surrender to you. Lord, this is your time. Move amongst these that are here. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.